open it to Jonah chapter 3. As you know, I'm in a series of messages from the book of Jonah that I'm calling Avoiding the Deep End. You can see that on the screen. There's the deep end of some things that you and I need to avoid. In chapter 1, we saw Jonah in the deep end of disobedience. We talked about how we can avoid disobedience. Chapter 2, last Sunday morning, we gathered and looked at Jonah in the deep end of self-sufficiency. We used prayer as a last resort when prayer should be the first thing we do. And it is self-sufficiency that will keep you from prayer and depending on God for the big things and the little things in, in your life. Today we're going to examine chapter 3. And while we won't get to it until the end of the message, we're going to see Jonah in the deep end of hypocrisy and haughtiness. Here for each one of us. But, but I began with the third chapter. Let me read these ten verses. Found in Jonah chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation. According to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And he cried out and said, yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They called a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation and said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let them call on God earnestly, that each man may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds and that they had turned from their wicked way, Then God relented concerning the calamity which He had declared He would bring upon them. And He did not do it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Would you just with your head bowed, ask the Lord to speak to you today. Just say, Lord, I know you got a word to say to me today and I don't want to miss it. So don't let anything distract from me receiving your word. Would you pray that for yourself and then pray for me. Say, Lord, just speak through my pastor this morning and let him say the words that would be pleasing to you. Let's let's pray for each other. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to praise you, to sing, Father, to you. And you inhabit the praises of your people. You are here. That is, that is so obvious today, Father. Now we come to your word, your holy word, your inspired word. And Father, I just pray that my words would line up with your word today. That my words, Father, would be pleasing in your sight. My words would be what you desire to say to your people this morning. And that, Father, you would meet each one of them at their point of need today. And I ask that and pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. A man's wife bought a new line of expensive cosmetics guaranteed to make her look years Younger. 
And after putting on all the miracle products, after she got all those miracle products applied, she asked her husband, Honey, look at me. What age would you say I am? With fear and trembling, no, no. Her, her, husband, her husband looked at her carefully and replied, Your skin looks like you're 18. Your hair looks like you're 21. And your figure, you look like you're 25. And the wife just gushed, oh, you flatterer. And the husband said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I haven't added them all up yet. <laughs> well, 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 when you add them all up, the great ship, the great sea, the great wind, the great fish, the great prayer. When you add all of that up, Jonah gets a second chance. Ever wish you could start all over again? Ever wish that something you've done could be undone? Maybe you've gotten a second chance. We serve a God of the second chance. And we're grateful. Jonah gets a second chance. God is going to let him do what he has vowed to do. The task is the same. The Ninevites are still violent people. The Ninevites are still wicked and immoral. They are still enemies of God's people. And Jonah sets off to share with them a word from the Lord. And the third chapter is the account of that adventure. It is a marvelous story of repentance, of God's grace and God's forgiveness. But then comes one verse... And it is that verse that will give us our life point this morning. But we'll get to that. First, let's look at this third chapter. Let's look at Jonah's trip to Nineveh and, and see what the Lord did. The words that begin chapter 3 sound a lot like the words that begin chapter 1. Arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah is right back where he began. On dry land, near Joppa having been belched out of the belly of a great fish. Boy, I bet he looked great. Seaweed wrapped around his head, half-digested fish guts slung over one shoulder, bleached out skin from all the stomach acids in that great fish. Seriously, though, here's what I find interesting. There's not one word of rebuke from God. There's not one mention of reproach from the Lord regarding his former disobedience. The Lord simply repeated his command. God is patient. God is merciful. Don't forget that. I'm thankful to God for the second opportunities in my life to do what God called me to do and be in the first place. There are three commands in verse 2. Arise, go, and proclaim. Proclaim the message that I'm going to tell you, Jonah. Don't revise it. Don't try to improve it. Don't try to update it. Don't try to make it popular. Just preach it. Just share it. Just tell it. So Jonah heads east from Joppa to Nineveh. 500, 550 miles away. It would have taken him about three to four weeks traveling on a camel or a donkey. Longer if he walked. That's about the distance from here if you left Mount Vernon headed east to Nashville, Tennessee. And if you notice in verse 3, Nineveh is called an exceedingly great city. That means it was 60, archaeologists have uncovered it and told us, 60 miles in circumference. The walls around it were a 100 feet high and broad enough 
to race three chariots side by side. They were running three wide in Nineveh. Population. Some scholars are conservative and say it was 120,000 people. Others, scholars say that there were upwards to 500,000 people in Nineveh. It was the largest city that we know of. It was the largest city of its day in the known world. Verse 3 describes it as a three days walk. In other words, it would have taken you three days to walk and see all of the city. Kind of like Disneyland, I think. But the phrase is interesting. An exceedingly great city. Because in the Hebrew, it literally says a God-sized city. Or it could be translated a God-encircled city. Meaning this city belongs to God. The people in this city are the object of His love. The people in this city He has great compassion for. A God-encircled city. Well, did Jonah just wander into the city? Did, did he meet with city officials and the city leaders? Did he just stand on the street corners and preach? We're, we're not told. But we are told his message. Five words in the Hebrew language. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Word overthrown is the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 18 and 19 to describe the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. This city, Nineveh, is going to be overthrown much like Sodom and Gomorrah unless they repent. It is a warning. It shows us the seriousness of sin and the certainty of God's judgment. The people of Nineveh Although the objects of God's love and compassion were wicked people, violent people. And God, even though He loved them, must punish their sin. And their sin had not escaped God's notice. So Jonah goes through the city preaching this five word message, literally as I said in the Hebrew. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And look at the response in verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. They called a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. They, They believed in God. They called a fast. They put on sackcloth. Not a bad idea, America. They believed the message Jonah preached. They believed that God's judgment is coming. They called a fast to acknowledge their sin. They put on sackcloth as a sign of repentance. Sackcloth is a garment made of goat's hair. Very similar to what you and I know as burlap. Here is a city shaken by a simple sermon from a strange prophet. The people of Nineveh repented, believed God. The word believed is the same word that is used in Genesis 15 to describe Abraham's response to the message of God. They believed, they trusted in God and His word. From the greatest to the least, it says, from royalty to the commoners, from the powerful to the powerless, from the old to the young, they believed every one of them. And verse 6 tells us, even the king got saved. It says, the king arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and he humbled himself by going outside the palace and sitting in a bed of ashes. Can you imagine the President of the United States going on national television and calling upon the nation to give up its violent deeds, turn away from the evil it has embraced, and seek God's mercy so that He might come and save us from judgment? Can you imagine that? That is what happened here. And guess what? God showed mercy. 
God pulled back his hand of judgment. Nineveh repented and God relented. Here is the incredible grace of God. Here is the incredible love of God. God did not desire the destruction of any of those people. God does not desire the destruction of anyone. But longs for their repentance and and, and their redemption. Now that's a good place to end the story. What a glorious ending. We can close our Bible. We can all go home. Because that's a great story. What a marvelous thing. The whole city got saved. Jonah was successful. They put his picture on the front page of the Nineveh City News. And and he will be invited to preach now at all the big churches and tell everybody how it was done Why he's going to be at First Baptist Babylon next Sunday morning. But, But the story doesn't end there. There's one more verse. And it will form our life point this morning. It's a verse about the wideness of God's mercy and the narrowness of our compassion. It's a verse about hypocrisy and haughtiness. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah... And he became angry. What? What? Let me take off my glasses. Did I read that right? But it greatly displeased Jonah. And he became angry. angry. Angry that they got saved. Angry that they repented. Angry that God, that, that God relented. Well, I, I expected the verse to say, And Jonah returned to his own land, rejoicing over the greatness of God's heart. This is probably the most shocking reaction to a spiritual awakening that I can find anywhere. Jonah was displeased with God. Not the Ninevites. With God. He's in the deep end, dear people. He's in the deep end of hypocrisy and haughtiness and self-righteousness and self-centeredness and judgmentalism and prejudice, lovelessness and line drawing. Jonah may be out of the deep end of the sea on dry land, But he's still in the deep end of hypocrisy and haughtiness. So here's my life point. Avoiding the deep end of hypocrisy and haughtiness requires avoiding drawing lines across people's lives. Jonah did not want a God who has a big heart, big enough to love all people. He wanted a God who was exclusive and narrow. Because that's what Jonah was like. And that's what you and I must avoid. Drawing lines across people's lives. Now let me explain to you what I mean. And we'll be through. You avoid the deep end of hypocrisy and haughtiness. By avoiding drawing lines across people's lives. Understand me. We draw lines that set us off from others. Now here's what I mean. We want to place a limit on the grace that saved us. We don't want a second chance for everybody. Although We've been given a second chance. Jonah seemed to forget that he needed God as badly as the people in Nineveh did. And he had forgotten the marvelous nature of God's grace, the magnificence of God's pardon, although he had experienced both. Have you forgotten the same? 
You don't want people to have a second chance. But you got a second chance. And so you draw lines that set you off from them. Second chances are due me, not you. Not you. Leonardo da Vinci, just before he began work on The Last Supper, the famous painting, had a violent argument with a fellow painter. Da Vinci was so bitter that he determined to paint the face of his enemy, the other artist, into the face of Judas in his painting. Thus making his feelings known for this man who would now live in infamy. The face of Judas was the first face he finished in the famous portrait, The Last Supper. And when he finished it, everyone that saw it recognized it as the face of the painter with whom da Vinci had quarreled. But when he came... To paint the face of Christ, da Vinci could make no progress. Something seemed to be holding him back. Something seemed to be frustrating his efforts. He just couldn't get it right. Numerous attempts on the face of Christ. He he could not get it right. And da Vinci came to believe That it was because he had painted the face of his enemy as the face of Judas. That he had put on canvas what his enemy didn't deserve. That he believed he had deserved and received. Da Vinci changed the face of Judas. And when he changed the face of Judas, the work on the face of Jesus began to go smoothly. There are some who believe the face of Judas in that famous painting, The Last Supper. There are some who believe the face of Judas in that painting is the face of Da Vinci. Because he came to realize that he needed the grace Just like his enemy needed the grace. God must show us the narrowness of our hearts. And the boundless mercy in his heart. You see, Jonah is the perfect example of this right here. You can go where you're told to go. You can say what you're told to say. You may actually conform to all that God has called you to do. And yet at the very core of your being. Maintain prejudices. And a haughty spirit. We we chafe against God's blessing on others. And resent His blessing on others. And forget His blessing and grace on us. So what brings us out of the hypocrisy and the haughtiness is simply this. To understand that we are no better than anyone else. No deserving, no more deserving of God's grace and kindness than anyone else. Having no more claim on God's mercy than anyone else. We must get out of the deep end. Because we get in the deep end when we start drawing lines that set us off from other people. We deserve more than they do. Here's the second thing we do. We draw lines that set God off from others. Is there anyone who you think Doesn't deserve for God to reach out and change? Is there anyone you don't think deserves for God to change them? 
They've done too much. They've gone too far. And they don't deserve the grace of my God. Anybody on the national scene come to mind? Anybody on the international scene come to mind? What about on the personal level of your life? How about that person who abused you? How about the mate who walked out on you? How about the friend who betrayed you? Anybody in your life or on your mind that you would draw a line and say, God, don't cross that line and show them grace. God, you stay over here and leave them over there. Because, God, if you show them grace, they might change. And and I don't want that. They don't deserve your grace. They deserve your judgment. Anybody like that in your heart this morning? That, That is the spirit of Jonah in you. You see, Jonah's preaching was a warning. Jonah wanted it to be a prediction. And when it didn't come true, he fell into the deep end of hypocrisy and haughtiness. Don't draw a line that sets God off from others. And then number three, we draw lines that set others off from God. Here's what I mean. Who have you given up on? I mean, you've just you've stopped praying for them because they're not ever going to change. I mean, you, you've given up on them. You've stopped praying for them because they're hopeless. They, they have gone too far. And, and so you have drawn a line that sets them off from God because you think they're impossible. That's an impossible situation. They're not ever going to come back. They're, they're not ever going to return. They're not going to be the prodigal that comes home. They're going to be the prodigal that stays away. They've gone to the far country and they are never going to return. And so we just draw a line that sets others off from God. And we give up on them and we quit praying for them. And we just say, I'm done with you. Can I show you a great verse? (laughs) Whoo, this is a great verse. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous, listen, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's the next verse. Verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. How many other believers in Corinth had written off the fornicator, written off the homosexual, written off the idolater, written off the adulterer, written off the thief, the coveter, the drunkard, the reviler, the swindler, written them off. They're not ever going to change. They're not, they've too far gone. God will never be able to do a work in their life. And the First Baptist Church in Corinth ended up with a bunch of them who had been changed by the grace of God. Because somebody didn't give up on them. Somebody refused to draw a line that sets them off from God. Don't don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on anybody. Don't draw a line across anybody's life and say they will never get right with God. Don't draw that line. You don't know your God and what He can do. Greatest words may be in all of Scripture. Such were some 
of you. You've been washed, justified, sanctified. Uh, let, let me close. Let me close. Have you grasped that God is the God of the second chance and the third chance and, and, and the fourth chance? Have you realized in what we have seen in Jonah's life so far that, that you can't outrun God's mercy and you can't plumb the depths of His grace? Then you will surely not draw any lines across people's lives. Lines that set you off from others because you're better. Lines that set God off from others because they don't deserve what you've received. Or lines that set others off from God because they're a hopeless situation. If you have realized the depths of God's grace and that you can't outrun His mercy, you will not do that. Because here, 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 here's this. Here, here's the point. The point Jonah had to learn was not that God loves even the Ninevites. But that God loves even me. That's the point. So if you're struggling with having compassion. Showing mercy to others. Gaze at the cross. If you're struggling with having compassion and showing mercy to others, focus on the cross. And there you will see God's patience with you, God's forgiveness of you. God loves even you. Repent of your line drawing habits. Show and share God's grace and mercy to others. And thank God for a second chance to do so. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. The challenge of it, Father. The goodness of it as we see your mercy and forgiveness the challenge of it, though, Father, to go and be what you've called us to be, to go and do what you've called us to do, e even though, Father, we didn't do it the first time. We didn't do it the second time, probably. Maybe the third time. We still didn't do it. And, Father, let us see Let us see that you love even me. Father, I pray for every child of God here in the sanctuary and is listening or watching this. I pray for every one of them, Father, to gaze at the cross, to focus on the cross. And there they will find your patience, your forgiveness, and your love. Father, we repent of our line drawing habits. We want to show your mercy and your grace to others. And we're grateful for the second chance to do it. Seal in our hearts what you've heard today, Father. What we've heard from you today, Father. Seal in our hearts what we've heard from you. It's in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. In a moment we'll stand and sing. We stand and sing to let you physically respond to what you've heard. There are times when we just need to make a physical response to what the Spirit of God has spoken to you about. Come to the altar and you pray and you kneel down and you tell God what, what it is that's on your heart and, and, 
And then you get back up and you go to your seat and you remember the time. You nail it down. You still like putting a stake in the ground. That morning, I went and knelt, Lord. Changed. I walked away. Changed. Maybe, maybe you're here and, and you're ready to open your heart and embrace the mercy and love that God has for you through Jesus Christ. For the first time, you would come and say, I'm, I'm accepting, I'm trusting, I'm believing in Jesus Christ. Wow. Make your way out of the row and down an aisle. I'm right here. Right here to pray with you, help you understand maybe what it is you're doing, what the next step would be. You come. If you have decided to be a, a official member of this church, this is a moment you can join our church. We'd gladly, gladly receive you. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. I want to thank you for watching, listening to our service this morning. If you have a question about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, or if you desire to become a Christian, would you please send me an email? I want to help you. My email address is pepper at fbcmv.com. Or if you would like to know more information about the ministries here at First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, let me direct you to our website. Our website is fbcmv.com. And it is there that you will find a whole host of information about the ministries we have for your children, for your students, and for you as well. So the website address again is fbcmv.com. Again, thanks for listening today and may you have a blessed week. I hope you'll tune in again and watch next Sunday.